Roger, understand. Go for a landing. 3,000 feet. Give me an LPD. 47 degrees. The Apollo 11 mission stands as one of humanity's greatest triumphs, forever etched in memory as the historic voyage that successfully transported humans to the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, courageous pioneers, cemented their names in history as the first individuals to grace the lunar surface. Amidst these celebrated figures, an often overlooked astronaut, Michael Collins, played a crucial role in the mission. Now emerging from the shadows, Collins sheds light on the eerie enigmas encountered during the lunar expedition. Join us in this video where we dig into the mind-boggling lunar secrets revealed by Michael Collins about their lunar odyssey. Number 20. The Birth of the Apollo 11 Mission In the early 1960s, President John F. Kennedy delivered stirring public speeches about his resolve to land a man on the moon. However, Confidential recordings of Kennedy's discussions later unveiled that his private interest in space exploration was overshadowed by his desire to outdo the Soviets. During a 1962 meeting with advisors and NASA administrators, JFK candidly admitted, I'm not that interested in space. While the allure of space itself didn't captivate Kennedy, he found motivation in political triumphs. Just months after his inauguration on April 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man to venture into space. It was a huge win for the Soviet Union. With a pressing need for a political triumph both within his administration and against the Soviet rival, Kennedy turned to Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, who, unlike Kennedy, had long championed space exploration. At the time, Johnson chaired a restructured Space Council. Seeking advice on how to outpace the Soviets, Kennedy looked to Johnson for guidance. Johnson's response highlighted that one of the most potent ways to assert U.S. dominance was by executing a manned mission to the moon. This pivotal insight laid the groundwork for the birth of the Apollo 11 mission. Number 19. The Insurance Covers The Apollo 11 astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, faced the possibility of not returning. A mere two years before their flight to the moon, a tragic fire during an Apollo 1 launch rehearsal had claimed the lives of the entire crew. This, on its own, was a reminder of how things could go horribly wrong. Despite NASA having its own insurance plan, astronauts were not covered while in flight due to the perceived high risk and experimental nature of space travel. This meant the most perilous part of the astronauts' job were uninsured by the agency. With families to consider, the astronauts sought a degree of assurance for their wives and children in the event of the worst scenario. In true American fashion, they took advantage of their fame. Before liftoff, each of the three men autographed numerous envelopes, each adorned with a unique design commemorating the mission and featuring a postage stamp celebrating a previous Apollo mission. The plan was to get these envelopes postmarked on launch or moon landing day with the intent of enhancing their value as collectible items. If the astronauts were not to return, their families could potentially sell these insurance covers, as they were known, to manage their circumstances. Number 18. Making Preparations NASA faced the challenge of preparing to send individuals to the moon. Their strategy involved creating simulations that imitated various aspects of what astronauts might encounter. Consider the issue of gravity, for instance. The moon's gravitational pull is merely one-sixth that of Earth's. To replicate this unique force, NASA's scientists positioned research participants at an angle, suspending them sideways while they walked along a slanted wall. These carefully observed simulations, conducted at Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, yielded invaluable insights into how reduced gravity could impact an astronaut's mobility, walking, jumping, and running. But before astronauts could explore the moon's gentle gravity, they had to figure out how to land there. To address this, a collaboration between NASA and Bell Aerosystems resulted in the creation of the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle, followed by the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle. The latter was utilized by the Apollo 11 crew for practice sessions at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas. 
These vehicles mimicked the moon's gravity using a turbofan engine that supported 83.3% of the craft's weight. Notably, Neil Armstrong, commander of the Apollo 11 mission, attested that the success of the historic moon landing owed much to these sophisticated simulations. Moreover, the extent of preparation extended to dramatic measures, including the deliberate formation of craters in Cinder Lake, Arizona, by NASA and the U.S. Geological Survey. This painstaking endeavor aimed to recreate a landscape similar to parts of the moon's surface. Number 17. The Command Module The Apollo 11 Command Module, also named Columbia, served as the living quarters for the three-person crew during their historic lunar landing mission. Despite its significance, the command module cabin was only as spacious as a large car. On July 16, 1969, Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin, and Michael Collins commenced their journey from Cape Kennedy aboard a Saturn V rocket. The command module, numbered 107 and crafted by North American Rockwell, constituted one of the three parts forming the complete Apollo spacecraft. Alongside it was the service module which housed the primary spacecraft propulsion system and essential supplies. The last part was the lunar module fondly known as Eagle, which Armstrong and Aldrin used to descend to the moon's surface on July 20. While the lunar module remained on the moon, the command module held the distinction of being the sole section to return to Earth. Following a NASA-sponsored tour of U.S. cities, the Apollo Command Module was physically transported in 1971 to the Smithsonian Institution, which is the world's largest museum, education, and research complex. This iconic artifact has since garnered distinction as a milestone of flight within the museum. Number 16. One of the most watched TV broadcast. Debates occurred at NASA about including a TV camera in Apollo 11's lunar module due to added weight. They eventually approved a black-and-white Westinghouse camera with a 16mm lens. Transmitting signals to Earth through the camera became an extra mission objective. When Armstrong descended onto the lunar module's porch, he revealed a storage assembly attached to the lander's lower stage. Inside was the black-and-white Westinghouse TV camera. This camera was specifically outfitted to cope with the stark contrast between light and shadow on the moon. The image and audio signals were relayed via a lightweight antenna located atop the lander. This umbrella-like antenna was sheathed in 38 miles of delicate gold-plated wire, finer than a human hair. It reflected the signal over 250,000 miles back to Earth. In the cabin, Aldrin activated a circuit breaker, sending black and white TV images of Armstrong to Earth. The images were grainy, marking a big step in broadcasting. Even years later, the Apollo 11 mission remains a remarkable broadcasting moment. Around 600 to 650 million people globally watched Armstrong and Aldrin's transmission from the lunar surface on July 20, 1969. Even parts of Europe watched despite the late hour. The moon landing is still one of the most watched TV broadcasts. Number 15. First Holy Communion on Moon When Apollo 11's Eagle Lunar Module touched down on the moon's surface, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin faced a significant challenge. They had to wait. Despite the anticipation to open the lander's door and step onto the unfamiliar terrain of an entirely different world, their mission protocol dictated a moment of pause before the monumental event. During this interval, Aldrin engaged in an unexpected and unprecedented act. He partook in the first Christian sacrament ever performed on the moon, a Christian communion ritual. As an elder at Webster Presbyterian Church, Aldrin had secured special permission before his 1969 space journey to carry bread and wine with him to space for the purpose of performing communion. Upon the Eagle Lunar Lander's successful touchdown, Aldrin retrieved a wafer from a plastic packet as well as wine and a small silver cup provided by his church. These items were stowed in his personal preference kit. He then communicated through the radio to the Earth-based ground crew, urging them to reflect upon the events of the preceding hours and express gratitude in their individual ways. Subsequently, Aldrin silently read from John 15 verse 5. This was a Bible passage he had inscribed on a 3 by 5 inch note card. Following this, he partook in the Holy Communion. 
Meanwhile, Armstrong observed silently, choosing not to participate. Aldrin believed that the service should be shared with the global audience. Unfortunately, atheist activist Madeleine Murray O'Hare, known for her prominent advocacy for the separation of church and state, indirectly hindered the broadcast of the communion service. Number 14. The Activists Not everyone shared the enthusiasm for the United States' mission to land individuals on the moon. A few days before Apollo 11's scheduled launch, a cohort of activists led by civil rights leader Ralph Abernathy staged a demonstration at the gates of the Kennedy Space Center. With them, they brought two mules and a rustic wooden wagon. They used these to draw attention to the contrast between the impressive Saturn V rocket and families struggling to make ends meet. In the midst of the anticipation leading up to the launch, Thomas Paine, the NASA administrator, ventured outside to engage the protesters directly. Paine and Abernathy engaged in a conversation despite a light rain. During their conversation, Abernathy presented three specific requests to NASA. Firstly, he sought permission for 10 families from his group to witness the launch. Secondly, he implored NASA to extend support to initiatives addressing the nation's poverty, hunger, and other societal issues. Lastly, he requested that NASA's technical experts contribute their skills to tackling the problem of hunger. In response, Payne expressed a desire for Abernathy's cause to align with the space program, using it as a catalyst to motivate the nation to confront challenges boldly across various domains. He envisioned NASA's space achievements serving as a metric by which progress in other spheres could be measured. Subsequently, Payne arranged for members of the activist group to attend the launch from an exclusive VIP viewing area. Abernathy prayed for the astronauts' safety and expressed pride in their achievement. Number 13. Fear of an Explosion the Saturn V stands as the most colossal rocket ever constructed by the United States. It was a behemoth of a launch vehicle that produced a staggering 33 million newtons of thrust during liftoff. Laden with 2.5 million kilograms of fuel and oxidizer, this monumental rocket wasn't without its challenges. The Apollo 6 test flight in 1968 witnessed the Saturn V rocket nearly shaking itself apart underscoring the very real risk of a launch pad explosion. Recognizing this potential danger, NASA had already gained awareness of the consequences. In 1965, engineers at the agency's Manned Spacecraft Center, which is now known as Johnson Space Center, conducted calculations that revealed the catastrophic impact of a fuel-laden Saturn V explosion. The force of a potential Saturn V explosion would be comparable to that of a small atomic bomb, equivalent to around half a kiloton, the magnitude of the bomb that devastated Hiroshima. To put it into perspective, the resulting fireball could extend to a width of 1,000 feet, accompanied by temperatures soaring up to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Fragments from the explosion might be projected as far as three miles. Considering these possibilities, NASA ensured the safety of VIP attendees during the Apollo 11 liftoff. Vice President Spiro Agnew, Former President Lyndon Johnson and other dignitaries were strategically positioned three and a half miles away from the launch pad, a precautionary measure in the event of an unforeseen explosion. Number 12. Michael Collins In the shadow of the 1969 moon landing, Michael Collins remains a less recognized name compared to Armstrong and Buzz. Collins covered 238,000 miles on the journey to the moon, yet he never set foot on its surface. Instead, he stayed in control of the command module during the eight-day mission, while Armstrong and Aldrin descended to the moon in the lunar lander, Eagle. For nearly 28 hours, Collins was the lone occupant of Columbia, while Armstrong and Aldrin conducted their lunar activities upon their return. He had a crucial task, redocking the two spacecraft. This was essential for the journey back to Earth. If something went wrong and Armstrong and Aldrin couldn't return, Collins would have had to come back alone. Despite being asked whether he regretted not landing, Collins was content with his role. He compared his job to that of a base camp operator on a mountain climb. Interestingly, Collins snapped a memorable photo during the mission. 
From the Apollo 11 command module, he captured Armstrong and Aldrin returning from the moon in the Eagle Lunar module, with Earth visible in the background. Observers later pointed out that this photo contained every person in existence, except for Collins himself. Number 11. In the Nick of Time Upon entering the lunar orbit, and later disengaging from the command module to initiate their landing sequence, Armstrong and Aldrin remained unaware that their moon landing strategy had already undergone an unanticipated adjustment. A few hours earlier, when the lunar module Eagle undocked from the command module Columbia, there was leftover pressure in the connecting tunnel that wasn't released properly. This caused the Eagle to get an extra boost during separation. Around nine minutes before landing, Armstrong realized they were off course and estimated they had missed the intended landing site by about three miles. The original site was chosen for its flatness, but now they had to find a new spot to land. Adding to the tension, the Eagle's computer triggered alarms during their descent, and radio communication with mission control was spotty. The recurring alarm came from the onboard landing computer, warning of potential overload. Luckily, mission control considered the risk low and allowed the landing. As they got closer to the lunar surface, another problem emerged. They were using more fuel than planned. Because of the off-course landing, they were almost out of fuel and had to find a new place to land quickly. With a mere 30 seconds of fuel remaining, Armstrong deftly guided the Eagle down onto an unplanned landing area, which would later be known as Tranquility Base, the first human outpost on the moon. Number 10. Fuel Line Blockage With the rush of adrenaline subsiding and the astronauts tending to their post-landing duties, another issue was quietly taking shape. Despite being shut down, sensors were signaling a pressure buildup within the landing engine's fuel line. The cause was clear. Ice had formed within the line, creating a blockage. As a result, the trapped fuel vapor was being heated by the still warm engine. Conversations between NASA and Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation, the company responsible for developing the lunar module, determined that this pressure surge posed a hazardous threat. If not addressed, it could lead to a potentially fatal explosion. To preempt such a scenario, plans were devised to vent the system. According to aerospace engineer Thomas J. Kelly in his 2001 book Moonlander, there was unanimous agreement that the prospect of an explosion, even involving the modest amount of fuel remaining in that short section of the line, was unpredictable and unacceptable. Now, before instructions for venting the system could be transmitted to Armstrong and Aldrin, the ice blockage thawed. This caused the trapped gas to be released, and the issue resolved itself. Number 9. The Fourth Man We are familiar with the Apollo 11 crew of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, but a crucial fourth crew member shared their voyage, the Apollo Guidance Computer. Known for being the most advanced control and navigation computer of its time, was impressively compact. It weighed 70.1 pound and required 70 watts at 28 volts direct current. Its programs were manually woven by hand into the hardware. Interestingly, today's equivalent of this computer's size would be a relatively large cell phone. The Apollo guidance computer played a pivotal role in managing the Saturn V rocket's journey, both in collaboration with ground-based computers and autonomously when signals were lost. Communication between the crew and the Apollo guidance computer relied on display and keyboard units called DASCII. The computer responded by displaying terms like prog, verb, and noun. To operate effectively, crew members needed to remember the corresponding numbers for the verbs and nouns in each command. For context, the Apollo guidance computer processed around 40,000 instructions per second, significantly fewer than the billions handled by today's laptops. Nonetheless, this is the technology the astronauts utilized to navigate the moon. Interestingly, there were two such computers on the Apollo 11 mission, one within the command module and another within the lunar module. Contemporary devices like laptops, phones, and even everyday objects like light bulbs surpass the Apollo guidance computer's computing power. Nonetheless, this machine was remarkably efficient and ahead of its time, contributing significantly to the space program and consumer technology progress. Number 8. Lunar Laser Retro Reflector 
Neil Armstrong's most enduring mark on the moon, a footprint left decades ago, remains an iconic image. This boot-shaped impression, captured in countless photos, continues to capture the imagination, drawing anticipation from future lunar visitors. Alongside it, the American flag stands as a recognizable symbol. However, these famous symbols aren't the only things left behind by the astronauts. Among the footprints, a two-foot-wide panel adorned with hundred mirrors rests in the moon dust. Known as Lunar Laser Retro Reflector, it was positioned by Aldrin and Armstrong on July 21, 1969, shortly before ending their moonwalk. Notably, the mirror positioned by Aldrin and Armstrong was just one of five retro reflector arrays transported to the moon in the late 60s and early 70s. Using these mirrors, scientists shoot laser pulses to ping the moon, and this helps them to precisely measure the Earth-Moon distance. This technique offers valuable insights into the moon's orbit and helps verify gravitational theories. Interestingly, the triumph of this initiative laid the groundwork for technologies such as GPS and other satellite-based systems that play an integral role in our modern lives. Number 7. Lunar Dust A significant question for NASA's Apollo 11 team was the moon's surface condition. Would the lander's legs land on solid ground or something soft? As we all know, the surface turned out solid, but the moon had an unexpected smell. Upon Armstrong and Aldrin's re-entry and pressurization of the Eagle lunar lander, lunar dust soiled their suits and equipment, emanating a distinctive odor. Aldrin compared the smell to burnt charcoal or the ashes from a fireplace with a bit of moisture. Before their departure from Earth, some individuals deemed lunar dust very hazardous, possibly even capable of igniting spontaneously in the air. This fear arose because the lunar dust had rarely encountered oxygen. Concerns arose that when the lunar module cabin was repressurized, the dust might heat up, smolder, or ignite. In response, Aldrin and Armstrong conducted an impromptu moon dust test. They did this using a grab sample, hastily collected by Armstrong and tucked into his spacesuit pocket in case of an emergency. They then placed this sample on the flat top of the Eagle's ascent engine cover. As the cabin filled with air, they observed if the lunar sample would smoke or smolder. If it did, they would halt pressurization and discard it. Fortunately, nothing occurred, so they proceeded with getting ready to depart the moon. However, regarding the moon dust's smell, scientists never had the opportunity to investigate further. Despite sealing moon soil and rock samples in containers for lab analysis, the scent vanished upon opening them back on Earth. Number 6. Armstrong's Detour during their time on the lunar surface, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin embarked on a two-and-a-half-hour mission. They worked side-by-side side to collect samples, document their findings and surroundings. Their activities were primarily scripted, aligning with the mission's objectives, but an interesting incident unfolded when Armstrong veered off course momentarily. Breaking from the plan, the first man on the moon ventured towards an area called Little West Crater. During this brief detour, Armstrong effectively went off the radar for about three minutes. Mission Control and Aldrin were unable to establish contact with him during this time. In those fleeting moments at Little West Crater, Armstrong snapped just nine photographs, and the details of his other actions there remain shrouded in mystery. Interestingly, there is speculation, bolstered by the 2018 film First Man, that during this time Armstrong might have left behind a bracelet bearing the name of his daughter, Karen. She had tragically passed away from brain cancer at the tender age of two, seven years before the moon landing. The intriguing part is that no one, not his fellow crewmates, not even his own sons, knows what Armstrong may have left behind on the moon at that moment. Now, it's time for today's subscriber's pick. The image you are looking at shows a circular structure situated on the moon's surface. You can as well see light emanating from distinct points. What are your theories regarding its nature? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Number 5. Saved by a pen. Upon landing on the moon, Armstrong and Aldrin readied themselves for their historic moonwalk. However, a slight mishap occurred. While adjusting their portable life support system backpacks, 
The astronauts accidentally dislodged the tip of a crucial circuit breaker. This specific breaker controlled the power supply to the ascent engine, the very engine that held the capability to launch them from the lunar surface. With this component damaged, their departure from the moon was compromised. Recognizing the seriousness of the situation, the astronauts promptly notified ground control, who began to brainstorm a solution. Armstrong and Aldrin then embarked on their moonwalk. Although a clear-cut solution eluded mission control, the astronauts were problem solvers and adept at thinking on their feet. Upon returning to the spacecraft, Aldrin, an engineer by training, took it upon himself to address the issue. He scrutinized the gap where the circuit breaker had been and realized that inserting an object could engage the missing button. A soft-tipped marker proved to be the perfect tool. Using the marker, Aldrin managed to press the circuit breaker in, successfully closing it. Aldrin's practical thinking saved the day. Number 4. The Prepared Speech While President Kennedy inspired the nation with the vision of landing a man on the moon, tragically, he was assassinated before witnessing the realization of his dream through the Apollo mission. The responsibility of overseeing this monumental achievement fell to President Richard Nixon, who assumed office in 1968. As Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took their historic steps on the lunar surface, President Nixon's apprehension reached its peak. The weight of potential mishaps loomed, as any failures would entail managing the nation's justified indignation over the expenditure of billions of tax dollars, culminating in the loss of two astronauts. Anticipating the worst, Nixon's team had prepared a statement to be delivered if catastrophe struck. He would deliver this speech to the world after contacting their widows. They had also arranged for a priest to hold a solemn ceremony to honor the departed souls. Witnessing the live broadcast of the Apollo 11 moon landing, the president could only hope that circumstances wouldn't necessitate the delivery of that prepared speech. Thankfully, those circumstances did not come to pass. The brave men who journeyed over 200,000 miles to the moon's surface returned unharmed. Subsequently, the United States achieved a remarkable feat, executing six successful crewed missions that resulted in 12 astronauts setting foot on the moon between 1969 and 1972. Number 3. Placed in Quarantine After their courageous mission, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins found themselves in an interesting situation upon their return. They were placed in quarantine for planetary protection. You see, since humans had never been to the moon before, NASA scientists were a bit concerned that they might bring back some dangerous space-borne disease. And so, once the Apollo 11 Command Module Columbia splashed down southwest of Honolulu, rescue divers from U.S. Navy recovery helicopters were right there in biohazard suits. They got to work immediately, scrubbing the hatch with iodine and tossing in these suits called biological isolation garments for the crew to put on. They were taking no chances. After this thorough cleansing, the astronauts and their spacecraft were given a good dousing of bleach. Then, it was time for a helicopter ride to an aircraft carrier. There, they were led straight into a mobile isolation unit. This unit was like a specialized transport, and it took them to NASA's Lunar Receiving Laboratory at Johnson Space Center. Inside, they were housed in a larger quarantine facility. They stayed there until they were released nearly three weeks later, on August 10, 1969. Just a few days after that, they were cruising down the streets of New York in a ticker tape parade, a hero's welcome for their remarkable feat. Over the next weeks and months, they were celebrated with many more events in their honor. Number 2. The Race to Make the Spacesuit Playtex, a well-known French lingerie brand, took on an unexpected role when NASA hired them to create spacesuits for the astronauts. These suits had to protect the crew from the moon's harsh environment. But this seemingly straightforward task turned into a secret fashion showdown. Complicating matters, NASA mandated Playtex to collaborate with the aerospace company Hamilton Standard. Consequently, Playtex's initial design fell into Hamilton Standard's hands. However, they discarded Playtex's version and came up with their own. Unfortunately, NASA rejected Hamilton Standard's design sending them back to square one. Facing a challenge, NASA decided to open the floor for competition. 
they invited others to pitch in with their own design ideas. In a twist, the story took an interesting turn. Playtex employees managed to sneak into Hamilton Standard's offices to retrieve their original design drawings. They resubmitted it to NASA, and that move changed the course of history. The outcome? Playtex's industrial division, ILC Dover, located in Delaware, has been crafting spacesuits for NASA ever since. Who would have thought that a lingerie company's expertise would play such a vital role in space exploration? Number 1. The Human Computer Following the Apollo 11 mission, the crew members gained iconic status in American history. Yet the vital role played by a brilliant black woman in ensuring the accuracy of the moon landing calculations often went unmentioned. You see, behind the scenes at NASA, a group of women known as the Human Computers carried out crucial work. Katherine Johnson, one of these talented individuals, was part of a team of skilled NASA mathematicians. With manual calculations, she determined flight paths essential for the success of the United States space program. Johnson's calculations contributed significantly to Neil Armstrong's historic step onto the lunar surface. For the Apollo 11 mission, Johnson's work helped synchronize the lunar lander and the command module, ensuring the safe return of the astronauts. Her precise calculations were instrumental in ensuring the astronauts' safety during their journey to and from space. Johnson's accomplishments extended beyond her profession as she overcame social and racial challenges as a black woman working at NASA in the 1950s and 60s. Her story was celebrated in the book and movie Hidden Figures. In recognition of her achievements, President Barack Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015. In 2017, NASA honored her legacy by naming a building after her, the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. This building is located at its Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. We hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one.